I'm Max Tegmark, a physics professor at MIT. Oh, are you a life form? I am indeed a life form. You sure? I'm a self-aware life form. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much the most basic thing I know. Okay, and uh, are we alone in the universe? <clears throat> My guess is that we are alone in our universe. By that I mean that I think we're alone in this, the spherical region of space from which light has had time to reach us during the 13.8 billion years since our Big Bang. I'm not saying we're alone, alone in all of space, but we're alone in the part of space that we have any ability to ever see or visit. Now, on the other hand, you're sitting next to a tree, right there, there's a tree over here, and you consider yourself alone because that tree is not self-aware? Is that what you're assuming? No, I mean, I think we humans are the only life forms in our universe that has gone to the point of inventing telescopes and this sort of advanced technology that we enjoy. So gotten to a point, so you're applying a one-dimensional scale to evolution then? You see, you, you use that language, or the well, stage, many people do, I'm just wondering, uh, do you subscribe to that? The, the telescope is an important milestone in technology because you know, before us, the technology is was such that the, sorry. the telescope is an important milestone to me in technology because before it was invented, nobody saw all those galaxies out there. So they weren't beautiful. They were just a giant waste of space. They were only beautiful because some self-aware life form, us, can see them. And it's through our observing our universe that it has meaning. If we were to go extinct and there were no life at all with telescopes, then... Um, who cares about all these galaxies? Well, we're, so, we're aware of our own death, for example, and, but most people spend most of their life trying to ignore it. She used the word self-awareness, and I was mentioning that a lot of people are self-aware in the sense that they know they're going to die, but they spend a lot of effort trying to get out of that self-awareness. So, uh, so what makes you think self-awareness is something that's good? I personally, I'm very grateful that I have consciousness, that I have this subjective experience. And I'm also very grateful that I um, have self-awareness in the sense that I can reflect on my condition because that makes me more able to uh, affect my situation and make it the way I like it. But if your brain were a hundred times bigger and you were a real narcissist, you'd be really, really self-aware, but I'm not sure it would be a contribution to the goodness of the universe. <laughs> My teenage son would already <laughs> argue that even with this brain, I'm a negative contribution to the universe because I don't let him play as many video games as he wants. But from my subjective point of view, my own personal point of view, I'm very grateful both that I have consciousness, that I'm not a zombie, and that I have self-awareness so I can reflect on things and uh, be the master of my own destiny. You want, you, so you believe in free will and you wish you had a bigger brain? Don't you don't wish your brain were a thousand times bigger? I don't believe in free will, no. Okay, well good, then neither do I, but, but would you wish your brain to be a hundred times bigger? Would that help? I certainly wish I were smarter. I don't know if I <laughs> well, usually, had a big head like that, that. <laughs> if my wife would like it very much. <laughs> she, might not have, she might have rejected my marriage proposal. <laughs> so which is more important, self-awareness or your marriage proposal? <laughs> if, if I had no consciousness whatsoever, I don't think it would have something much good if she accepted my marriage proposal because I wouldn't have been aware of it. Right. Well, you know, everything, all you carry out have I mean, sex, so... Yeah, I know, but if, if, to me, meaning comes from experience. It, it's my experiences that make my life, my life worth living. And if I had no experiences because I were just a zombie, you know, going through the motions... But if you're but, more aware, they'd have more intense experiences. Yeah. Something and if you're really, thing. really, 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 really aware, you'd have more and more and more intense experiences. So yeah. you'd be... So it'd be better? I think we humans probably do have a stronger kind of experience, a more intense kind of experience than a bacterium or even um, a snail does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so what did you say, answer the question, are we alone, what did you say? My guess, so I have a minority view. My guess is that we actually are alone at least in our universe, this part of space that we can see with our telescopes. So the observable universe. The observable universe. And this... you think we're alone because? You know, we just have found planets around every star, probably even Earth-like planets around most stars. So, so how does that jive? How do you, what's the logic? What's your reasoning? Yeah, my argument has to 
do with um, two things. First, there's the Fermi paradox, of course, that, yeah, sure, we have loads of planets you can live on, but um, there are over a billion of them in our galaxy alone that are over a billion years older than ours. We know that because of a paper that Charlie Lineweaver, <laughs> you, wrote. So if life were commonplace on Earth-like planets, then there would be loads and loads of civilizations that could have colonized Earth and turned us into a parking lot, you know, over a billion years ago. And none of them has. So somewhere along the way from no life to space-faring life, there's a big roadblock. I'm hoping that roadblock lies in front of us. Sorry. <laughs> You're hoping it lies in front. I'm hoping that roadblock. Wrong answer, Max. I'm hoping that roadblock lies in back of us, so we're already past it. I thought you were suicidal there for a second. <laughs> yeah, I hope we die soon. <laughs> and um, I just talked to Robin Hanson, by the way, about uh, this, about the great filter. And yeah, so, and um, I just don't buy this argument that uh, oh, there yeah, there are a billion civilizations with spacefaring technology in our galaxy, but they all just decided to sit home and play video games or meditate. That's why you haven't seen them. It only takes one with sort of expansionist tendencies, and they would be all over the place. Uh, I think a much more likely explanation is that life has to overcome some sort of filter. There is some big roadblock in going from no life to here. Maybe the, the problem is obviously not finding good planets, because there are loads of them, Maybe it's something very early on in, in the origin of life, like getting the first ribosome or something like that. Um, maybe it's something much later, getting from fairly smart life to internet creating life. The dinosaurs stomped around here for over 100 million years, never showed any sign of inventing the internet or robots or space travel. I don't know what it is, but I think <clears throat> there's at least one roadblock. So you can just do the math then and ask how far away is our nearest neighbor planet going to be? And uh, I did a calculation of this and, and concluded that the most likely one is probably far outside of this part of space that we call our observable universe. Well, I think you did a calculation about how far away the nearest Max Tegmark is. So how many times further away than that observable universe is the nearest Max Tegmark. Oh, that's way, way farther. How far? In How fact, much farther? In fact, if you go a Google, about a Googleplex meters away, you get an identical copy of our whole universe, complete with human civilization in it. And that's about one where the Google zero is, where Google is one with 100 zeros. But you don't have to go that far to find life, I think. You just have to go way more than 10 to the power 26 meters, which is how far we are to the edge. And that already means, for all intents and purposes, it's up to us, humans, whether life will one day flourish throughout our cosmos or whether it'll stay on this planet or even go extinct. Well, wait a minute. How, let's, let's ask that question again. How close is the nearest Max Tegmark to this Max Tegmark? Oh, <clears throat> now exactly does... identical Max Tegmarks are pretty rare, so you have to go... Um, over over ten to the twenty, um, over ten to the ten to the twenty meters away, which is ridiculously far. But it, I'm not saying that I think the nearest life that can build telescopes and spaceships is that far. I'm just saying I think it's probably farther away than the part of space we can reach. Which means that the, whether life, whether our cosmos is going to come alive one day, and be teeming with 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 advanced civilizations. It's probably going to depend on what we do on Earth. So, so wait, so you think telescopes are more likely than Max Tegmarks? Oh, yeah. Really? Way more. Way more. How much? Factor of a billion? A trillion? Much more. Ten to the Avogadro's number? What do you Something call? like that. <laughs> yeah. You could, you could have life that looks very, very different from us, which would still find an interesting to try why, to Why couldn't we have stars? billions of universes with Max Tegmarks in them, but no telescopes? Why do you think that... Telescopes are more common than Max Tegmarks. I think most really advanced civilizations are kind of curious about stuff and, and invent the technology they need to, to look around in their, in their cosmos. So you think advanced civilizations are more common than Max Tegmarks? Oh, yeah. Why do you say that? Because I consist of you know, 10 to the 28 particles, and there are incredibly many different ways you can put them together. Even if you just start imagining what different life forms could look at, you know, look like 
there are so many different designs that are not even two-legged, two-armed kind of things. Uh, to have someone who is exactly like me, who knows exactly this weird language English that we've invented here on Earth and so on, that's pretty unlikely. Well, how, well that's a, but, the, but I've argued that, do you think English is a set of measure zero? Or Swedish? If, or? You, if you think about how many things you have to specify to write down the English grammar and the English dictionary and all that stuff, you know, there's so many different permutations and combinations. Is it finite? The there is a finite number of ways you can do it, but it's huge. I mean, suppose I just take the word, the word orange and I switch it with the word banana. How many switches could I do? I could have switched banana with a car instead, or I could, I could instead of calling it car, I could call it rack. There is an absolutely vast number, even of languages you can invent. So I think the reason we speak the way we do is not because it's some sort of law of physics that says that everybody on all planets will evolve speaking like that. That's just a historical accident. And we have good evidence of that too. Just go to some other country and see what they came up with independently. It doesn't sound exactly like English. Huh, so, well, but what about the idea of a set of measure zero? What can you tell me about that? Because that's not often, often we only talk about things with probabilities between zero, between ep epsilon, and it gets closer yeah. and closer to zero, but yeah. never zero. But what about, I'm interested in this idea of, of sets of measure zero. Things I mean, that can never, ever happen. Well, think, well, things that maybe everything that happens is impossible. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not so convinced that there is, I don't feel we know enough right now to be able to say for sure what's strictly impossible because um, just say things about what's very, very un unlikely, but I, I think, I think it's important on one hand for us to not get so arrogant, we humans, and think that this is the only way that advanced technological, technology inventing life can be. It's at the same time important also, I think, to not um, take for granted that, oh, space is out there that we can see is so big, there's got to be, it's a sort of Star Trek reality with all those other civilizations. So it doesn't matter if we screw up our planet go extinct because all those Star Trekkies out there are going to keep our universe awesome anyway. I think that's sort of an abdication of responsibility and uh, I think we need to, fa to face up to the fact that it may actually come be our responsibility, the whole future of advanced life in our, in our cosmos. And I think it would be the most pathetically dumb thing ever if, if we use our technology to drive our life extinct here. You talk about us taking control and using our technology, and yet earlier you said you don't believe in free will. So how does that? How can you have responsibility and no free will at the same time? Free will, I think, is just one of those silly uh, debates where people argue about definitions. It's, Obviously, it feels like you have free will. On the other hand, I'm a feels physicist. Like have, feels I like you have that, responsibility. I know, too. I know that I'm actually a computer made of carbon atoms and stuff and what I decide to say and do simply depends on what the laws of physics shuffling particles around. The reason it feels like you have free will is simply because it takes at least 10 seconds for me to pr calculate what I'm going to say 10 seconds from now. So right, right. No, I'm all about the, that, but you're preaching to the choir, but what about, the, you use the word responsibility as if there weren't anything ambiguous about it. I mean. I'm using my brain, free will or not, to compute what to do. <laughs> and I want, to me, it's a, an absolutely wonderful thing that after 13.8 billion years, our universe has woken up, it's come alive with life that has these conscious experiences. And the, the, because of this, now there exists beauty and meaning and purpose in our universe, which there didn't when there was just a bunch of gas. Uh, and I think it's also the case that the, a universe can get even more awesome. The vast majority of all the resources in our universe are not alive or just wasted right now. I think it would be fantastic if life can, if it turns out that we are the seeds of something much grander and in the future there can be more life throughout our cosmos. And at the same, in the same vein, I think it would be absolutely pathetic if, if we're so small-minded that we just blow it and go extinct and this great cosmic endowment gets wasted. So uh, you saw the movie Contact with Jodie Foster. I did. At, at the end, there's a child who says, are we alone? And she says, well, if we are, it would be an awful waste of space. Now, when I heard that, 
I felt, oh, that sounds kind of interesting and funny. And then I thought, I thought of Australia, about when Captain Cook came and says, hey, Terra Nullis, there's nobody here. Of course, there were people. Except there were. Yeah, except there were. So, so I'm wondering, you know, what, what do we mean by, anyway, what do you think of that? Do you think, do you agree that it's an awful waste of space if uh, we are alone? Well, there, it used to be a time when there was nobody in our entire observable universe with telescopes when there was just a bunch of hot plasma expanding in all directions, right? Gradually, life ap appeared here, and we invented telescopes, and are, now there is an awareness, and the universe is aware of itself in the sense that it, there's life that knows that there are galaxies. Uh, I think if we, went, if we invented more powerful technology and used it to, to just go extinct, then, and our universe because of that turned out to never really come alive, right? That then it would be a huge waste of, sp waste of space. Right now I think there's this enormous potential for life to, to the spread and for, for this civilization we have here to just be the beginning of something even more awesome. But a lot of microbiologists would disagree with you and say, hey, if we kill ourselves, then that's great, then the microbes are still going to be around as they always have been for four billion years. On this planet, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, but that doesn't mean, but I think they're very unlikely to ever get to the moon or Mars, let alone the Andromeda galaxy. I thought they already were on the moon. Matter of fact, there are probably more microbes visited the moon than, than human beings. Okay, but I don't think they've made, there's clearly none of our Earth microbes that have made it to Andromeda. And if it's true, that there is a great filter so that it's very, very hard to get from the microbe stage to the space faring stage, right? Then if we go extinct, our Earth microbes are never even going to get out of the Milky Way galaxy. Most of the billions of galaxies out there may just remain boring forever. Well, unless they stay a cyst for a very long time on a piece of rock that gets blown out of some planetary system. Yeah, but, there's, but if there's a great filter, blown out or not, there's still, those microbes are still very unlikely to invent the internet. Right? Okay. So I'm, I'm saying, I think, I th I'm an optimist. I think there is this potential for life to, to flourish beyond our wildest dreams. And I, I think we humans should uh, think a bit more long term and make sure we actually work towards making this happen and, and not squander it. The way I see it, we're in this race between the growing power of technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage our technology. And as long as we win that race, life can become even more awesome and flourish throughout our cosmos. If we lose the race, we're just going to go extinct. And um, sooner or later, we're, we're going to have a technology that's too powerful and for us to man manage, and poof, game over. Well, game over for our species, but species go extinct after two or three million years anyway, so... Uh, yeah, but that's why? why I keep coming back to this great filter, because if it's true that there are, in fact, over a billion other Earth-like planets that have existed on this, in this galaxy alone for over a billion years and still haven't invented the Internet or colonized space, right, then if we screw up here and our species goes extinct, there's less than one in a billion chance that anything interesting is going to happen here again at this level. Now, Stephen Hawking has uh, famously said we should keep our heads down and uh, not broadcast our existence out of space. Do you agree with that? I guess out of fear of advanced aliens. On one hand, I think it's a good saying, you know, don't scream in the jungle. Don't we scream all, in the jungle. We obviously don't gain anything. Don't give off it. odors in the jungle. <laughs> yeah, we obviously don't gain anything from it. On the other hand, if I'm right in this, in my guess about how rare life actually is, capable of picking up radio signals and coming here, then it doesn't make a hoot of a difference. Okay, so it's a, it's a lonely universe, but not, we're not completely alone if you go far enough. I think to find another civilization as advanced as ours, we need to go outside of our observable universe, which is really, really big. How far? Well, uh, this is so big, it's taken 13.8 billion, billion years for light to reach us, even just from the edge. And by definition, we can never get outside okay. you know, of this. So. If, if we're alone in this, we're always going to be alone, and the, except if we create our own company by helping spread life throughout this. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, is it any... Uh, why are you interested in this big picture, this scientific origin of how, how we got here? Why? Is that important? Is the question, are we alone, important? 
or is it just I don't stupid academic? Thing. I don't live my life and think about things because I think they're important. I, I think about them because I, I love thinking about them because they fascinate me. And uh, I think thinking about the big picture is one of the coolest things there is to think about. I think humanity without cosmology is like a person with Alzheimer's disease, always confused about where he is, you know, where he's going and where he comes from. And thanks to thinking about these big questions, I'm hopeful that we humans can get a clear understanding of our origins and our future possibilities. So you don't put much stock in an Alzheimer's point of view? <laughs> I'm very grateful that I don't have Alzheimer's. But you know, right you're now. always meeting new people when you have amnesia. Right? <laughs> okay, so is, so is this question, are we alone, important? I find that to be one of the most fascinating questions that there is. Because when I talked to Robin Hanson, he said uh, the question, are we alone, is, I said, hey, I'll give you $100 billion if under the condition that you try to answer this question, are we alone? And I said, what'd you do with it? What would you do with this $100 billion? And he said, I'd put it in the bank. And I said, why would you do that? He says, because the question, are we alone, is not urgent. We don't need to know that. We need to solve poverty and, and all the other things and disease that we have to deal with. And are we alone is not so important. And therefore, we should put it in the bank until it becomes urgent. And it probably never will. So let's take all the money away from cosmology. What do you think of that? I think it's a weak argument. <laughs> I think the reason that we have so much poverty on this planet and the reason that we are messing up our climate and doing so many other dumb things is precisely because we're refusing to think enough about the big picture. We're so obsessed about the next election cycle that we lose track of the big perspective. Thinking about whether we're alone, even thinking about what's going to happen on Earth in a hundred years is exactly the kind of long-term thinking which, if more of us did it, right, would cause there to be much, much less problems with this planet. So you're a multiverse expert, so the more universes there are, the more aliens there are? Certainly, there is some probability that any random planet evolves advanced life. So if you have 10 times more space, you expect on average 10 times more aliens, yeah. So what do the ideas of a multiverse have to do with aliens? Is that the only thing, just uh, multiplication? Yeah, I think basically, yeah. If space really, for, if the space that we live in is actually such that it goes on far beyond the reaches of what we can see, which m almost all my astro colleagues think, then it's much more likely we have aliens. If space is actually infinite, which is the prediction of the simplest kind of inflation models, and inflation models are the most popular explanations for how a Big Bang happened, right? If that's true, then you're guaranteed that there are going to be aliens somewhere else. Because the probability of aliens is non-zero? And you multiply that by infinity, so... Now, you, you're sure they're non-zero? That's why I'm interested in this idea of a, cons a set of measures. Yeah, I, I think the probability of, of mm -hmm. us getting advanced life on any one planet is not zero since we're here. And um, that means if inflation made an infinite space full of galaxies and planets, the question is just how far away the nearest neighbor is. But I, th I think the nearest neighbor is probably farther away than, the, than what we can see. So it won't ever have any practical consequences for us. We will never be able to make contact with them anyway. They can't come here and be nice to us, and they can't come here and kill us either. Okay, so you're not afraid of aliens. Now, I, I'm <laughs> afraid of people. Our, our, I think we should be more afraid of ourselves, because obviously the biggest threat to... Uh, other animals on this planet are us humans, and the biggest threat to us, us humans is also us humans. So you seem to subscribe to, I think, so, to something that Carl Sagan said it again and again, that we are the universe becoming self-aware. I do. And, that, and that's an important thing. I think it's a beautiful idea. But we're really bad at smelling, for example. Dogs are really more aware of the sm sense around us, but we don't think that dogs have more of what makes the universe important. Than oh, we do. I love non-human animals. Also, I think we sh it's we shouldn't. It's terribly arrogant when people say that oh, other animals are inferior somehow to us. Don't have s souls and whatever. We can slaughter them in horrible ways. <laughs> but you're using self-awareness as a as a good. Therefore, less self-awareness is a bad. I think there it's it's 
self-awareness is obviously not an either or thing. It's something that can come in in degrees. Yeah. And the more you have of it, the better? I think the more of it there is, and the more positive experiences there are in the universe, the better. And, and certainly if... But it keeps you from dancing, though. If self-aware people don't know how to dance. They think about it and they just sit there in the corner because they're so self-aware. So it's obviously an inhibiting thing. And when you're aware of your own death, then you get drink. afraid of life. <laughs> you know, you, you can't live sometimes. Um, I'm quite aware of my own mortality, but I think that actually makes life more beautiful. You know, when you're... You Especially can, when you you're you want to seize the, seize the moment and, and live life to the fullest because you, you know it's not forever. So uh, self-awareness, bring it on. <laughs> so based on the, the measurement of flatness of the universe, we say that the entire universe is about 60 times larger than the, the observable universe? Or is that the number that we should quote? Well, yeah. If space is not curved at all, then it will go on forever. Mm -hmm. if, if it doesn't connect back on itself as a donut, at least. And... Um, from the kind of measurements we have of, from the microwave background, baby pictures of a universe that you, Charlie, worked on for your mm -hmm. PhD thesis, mm -hmm. uh, we can measure that, yeah, in that case, space, our space is a lot bigger than the part of space we can see. But how much bigger? That's what my question Probably at least 60 times bigger in radius. 60, so, at least so 60 many, times Many bigger. thousand times bigger in volume. It may well be infinitely bigger, in fact, yeah. if inflation theory is, is but correct. How, what's the smallest it can be? It's probably about 60 times 60 this radius, times. or 60 cubed times so more about, volume. So about the size of this house compared to that ball then. Yeah, so over 200,000 times more volume, so over 200,000 more times more galaxies than, oh. than we can ever see. So did you just multi, did you just do 60 cubed in your head? Or did <laughs> yes. you thought about that before? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guilty. All right. Um, so when you visit other countries, Smiles mean the same thing, but the relationship between the sexes can be very different. So in other words, there are some universals about visiting other countries, and there are some cultural differences. So the question is, what about these universes? Let's talk about the universes beyond the observable universe. Do you think they will all have the identical speeds of light and ratios of the proton to the electron mass and G, big G, etc.? What are the things that you might expect to be different? Well, yes and no. So I think there's probably more than one kind of parallel universe. First of all, there's the level one, as I call it, which is just in the same space are the regions as large as this one. Well, let's just talk about and, level one. Then. And Does there, it it's, it's actually all those constants of nature that we learn in school are the same. We would learn the same thing in physics class over here, but we would learn different things in history class because the particles over there started out in different arrangements. The planets formed in different places and history played out differently. If Everything you, about physics will be the same no matter how far you go in this level one multiverse. But you will learn very different things in history class. But, again, but a lot of people are looking for changes in alpha, for example. or they're Yeah, the, and so we should. We haven't found any yet. But you don't think uh, they will find them? Or something. I'm guessing that we will not. Uh, and then there's a level two multiverse. If inflation theory is true and if, if, if the, whatever the fundamental theory of quantum gravity is, if it has more than one solution, then you can show that actually a lot of these so-called constants we learn aren't constants. They're things that can be changed if something is violent as, in, as inflation shakes them up. And they will then be different Wait, across no, the no, second no, I level. Get, I want to ask you specifically, can they change or does, is there something about inflation that suggests that they are different? If the fundamental theory of physics is, uh, say, string theory, and it, has, then it, and it has more than one solution, and each different solution to these equations may correspond to a different value of, say, the proton-to-electron ratio. So here, we're in the part, the kind of space where the solution is, uh, is uh, such that the proton is 1,836 times heavier than the electron. There might be another solution where it's 2,016 times heavier. Is this a continuous variable you have in your head that you're using, or is it a discrete it variable? It may or may not be. Uh, in, the, in the simplest models, it's discrete. Uh, but, it, but there are so many different settings of, of these knobs that it's likely you can get a vast range of, of it. And if that's true, but then, then the, the even larger space where this level 2 multiverse lives is very diverse. 
And the, I'm, not, I'm less interested in the diversity because everybody talks about how wonderful the diversity is. But what I'm interested in is, is there any evidence that suggests that that diversity exists? The evidence for any evidence for inflation is there evidence for it, and so if any evidence that the fun, so that the fundamental theory of physics, whatever it is, has multiple solutions. So take water. We know that the equations of water have three solutions: ice, liquid water, and steam. And if you if you're a fish and you've spent your whole life just living in the ocean, you might write a physics book for fish saying, "Oh." The sound speed in water is this much, right? And that's universal. And you would be wrong because you wouldn't know that there are also icebergs and that there's also steam where the sound speed is different, right? And uh, we've, tended, we've found that pretty much all complicated mathematical equations tend to have multiple solutions. So it's not such a shocking idea that even if string theory is wrong, whatever replaces it, might also have more than one solution for how space can be. And probably not three solutions like for water, but probably much more solutions. And uh, then what we've arrogantly called universal constants of nature will just be things that are telling us about part of our address in the bigger space. So, so what is it exactly about the theory of inflation which suggests to you that these things will be different? Um, to, for a layman, can you explain that to a oh, layman? So that has nothing to do with inflation at all. So, so there are two separate things I'm saying here. One is, if you have some sort of equation that describes uniform water or uniform space, it may be that it, it has, that equation has multiple solutions. For water, it has three solutions, liquid, solid, and gas. For space, no, maybe it no, has a, a Google solutions. So that's one idea. The second idea is, how can you change from one solution to the other? In case of the case of water, you need to put in a lot of energy to melt the ice, right? In the case of space, you need to have something even more violent to change one to, kind into another kind, something super violent, like, for example, inflation, but which is just tearing things apart and, and doubling the size of something in a split second. But does that violence necessarily bring with it a different result. If we replay the inflation again and again and again, could it be the case that it always produces the same C, the same G, the same ratio of protons, the same, you know, lambda? And you can also prove that inflation is the great enabler in a sense that it, it will actually not just make a lot of space, but it's going to make space of all possible kinds and in huge amounts amounts. So it, inflation is a very creative force that transforms the potential existence to actual existence. It will actually make this kind of space of type A here and then a huge swath of space of type B and so on. And these swaths tend to be much, much bigger than the part of space we can see. It, so we it, can get duped into thinking that just because <clears throat> it's always type A space everywhere we look with our telescopes, it's the same everywhere, but it isn't. What do you, well, I'm still trying to get, what is it, I, I understand that there's room for the freedom to have these variabilities. What I'm asking about is what is it that suggests, for example, when people thought, heard of GR, they said, hey, let's talk about Brands Dickey, we're going to generalize it. Yeah. But then you <clears throat> generalize it, but that was a stupid generalization because it's just normal GR. I'm wondering if inflation, if what you're talking about is just a, a stupid generalization in which when we go out, if we could measure the unit multiverse and say, oh, by the way, now that we know more about inflation, we see that every time, even if it's a multiverse, it produces the same thing. Is that the... Well, <clears throat> we have to be open-minded and acknowledge that we don't know these things for sure, but what, you can, what we can calculate from physics is that there's a certain... If, you, if there's more than one solution, there's a certain amount of energy or violence needed to switch from one kind to the other. And if you have inflation that's more energetic than that, then it will switch between the different kinds and you'll get this diversity. If inflation that happens at very low energy, it might not be able to flip one kind of space into another. And then you could just make huge amounts of but, one of the same. But you use the term more than one solution. Now, in this Brands Dickey example, you can have general relativity and then yeah. you can generalize it so it has more than one solution. Yeah. So the question is, is that generalization needed? I can always create an equation that has more than one solution right. and I can meet billions of solutions. But is that generalization 
required by the evidence that we now have on inflation? Ah. Well, I don't think we should, our universe cares whether we need something or not. You know, our job is to look carefully at the evidence and, and see what it seems to suggest. What we do know is that people in string theory research found, much to their horror in fact, that it seemed to be this way. They were kind of hoping for the opposite. So it's, they didn't put it in there because they felt it needed it. It was sort of something the, the, math, the equations forced upon them. Uh, maybe string theory itself is a flawed theory. That's for ultimately for experiment you know, to judge. But we have to be very open to the possibility that, that, um, if you could, that on the very grandest scales, our cosmos might be even more diverse than we think. It might not be that just because the proton is 1,836 times heavier than the electron here. It's that way everywhere. In the Planet of the Apes uh, movie with Charlton Heston, his crew lands on a strange planet and he sees horses and corn and four species of apes and uh, mute humans and chimps and they're speaking English. And it only when he sees the half-buried Statue of Liberty at the end that he says, oh my God, what have we done? Does he realize that he's on the earth? now? Let's put Max Tegmark and his crew into a spaceship and you don't know that you, you think you might go to another universe. And you wake up and you say, okay, am I in my universe still or am I in a new universe? What kind of measurements would you and your crew make? Well, it's, I think I would, assuming I couldn't find uh, anything that looked like the Milky Way galaxy or our solar system, I could do this, go the slow route and start measuring the constants of nature and seeing if they're the same, but I wouldn't actually need to because it's, I could just <laughs> check my pulse. If I'm alive, then the, the <coughs> constants of nature are probably about the same. Wait, because you, because you, we found it's remarkable actually how delicately tuned these parameters are. Most of the, the, the constants of nature, if you tweak them a little bit, something goes haywire and life so your Doesn't pulse work. would change if the speed of light were a billionth of a well, percent? Well, it would go to zero. <laughs> well, there are a lot of constants. If you change the strength of the electromagnetic force by a few percent, you know, the sun would explode, for example. That would be bad for my pulse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you'd first you'd look up if at you, the sky and see if there are stars or something. If you, yeah, if you, if you change um, a few other parameters by just a little bit, then all the hydrogen atoms in my body would de decay into neutrons in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes and I would die so there <laughs> basically if you find it do we find that we can survive in there it's pro it's either our universe or a very remarkably similar one so you take your continued survival as a as an example of that you're in the same universe yeah or you just don't go to that travel agency that sells you <laughs> trips to random other universes because okay. you're probably not going to like it okay is reality a simulation I noticed you gave a talk about that at the with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So w w one way of asking the same question is, do the Heisenberg uncertainty relations have anything to do with the finite time resolution and spatial resolution of a simulation? Well, my personal guess is that we're not in a simulation. Based on what evidence? I think that the simulation argument is flawed. So the, basic, the way the argument goes is that seems like we're building ever more powerful computers that should be able to ultimately simulate human minds that will feel indistinguishable from the real thing. And we'll be able to have, ultimately have much more simulated minds in our universe than real ones. So therefore, I am a simulation too, most likely. The, so the easiest way to see that there's something screwy with this argument is to just do it again and say, okay, suppose we buy it, I am a simulation. This whole universe is a simulation. So in the simulated universe, we're building ever more powerful computers that are going to simulate minds. There are going to be more of them than the real thing. So therefore, I must be doubly simulated, a simulation in the simulation. Etc. And then I can repeat this again and say I'm a simulation in a simulation in a simulation. I can repeat it a hundred times. I'm a simulation in a simulation at ad nauseum. And, and, and this is clearly, this is clearly, <laughs> there's something rotten here. In this argument, reductio ad absurdum, hmm. and I can tell you what I think it is. Also, I think the flaw in the argument is that, in order to make this argument, that there are more simulated minds than real minds according to the laws of physics, 
you have to know what the real laws of physics are in the basement universe, the one that's not simulated. Right? But if we are in a simulation now, then we have no clue what the actual laws of physics are. These would then be the simulated laws of physics that don't permit us to make this argument. So. Until they change the code or something. <laughs> okay. So I'm not losing too much sleep over that. All right. No, yeah, well, well, one other argument against it is, so what? I mean, if it's a real good simulation, then it's reality. What's the difference between simulation and reality? I don't get it. If you, sometimes you can make a map, you know, you're one-to-one -one scale, but you also make a map point nine to one scale. You make a map yeah. that's more real than reality or something. Well, I guess the difference is if, you, if you're convinced you this is not a simulation, and you believe the laws of physics, then you have kind of a, a life insurance that these laws of physics are going to keep ticking away and they keep existing for billions of years. So you can have a long future for your civilization if you're careful. Whereas if it's a simulation, then you should act a little bit differently. You should really do really interesting and cool things so that the person simulating you doesn't get bored and shut you down. <laughs> well, I thought the person simulating you would be controlling what you're doing. I don't... Well, I think oh, that's the usual right. hypothesis it, that's is they simulate right. you as a, as a game right. in The Sims or something. I see. If it does interesting things, you'll keep getting... All right. So, I, yeah, as if you had a choice. Okay. okay. Imagine <laughs> if you're playing this incredibly boring video game and your Sims just sit there and don't do anything. You'd probably turn it off, off after a while, wouldn't you? Rather well, than just spend electricity... Right, but Super Mario it. probably can't decide what to do, though, on the other hand. It's probably... Anyway, Wilmer, Yuri Milner... Milner gave $100 million to uh, look for life elsewhere. Um, if I gave you a billion dollars or $100 billion, how would, what would you, and with the caveat to you have to help answer the question, are we alone, what would you do? Anything different from what's being done now? I think what's being done now with Project Listen, thanks to Yuri Milner's generosity, is awesome. I'm all for it. My guess is they're not going to find anything, but we should absolutely look. Um, and... Um, There's no shortage of additional things we can do. Basically, what we should do is I would invest a lot of that billion then in um, much better astronomy research across the board because it's precisely when we look really carefully at things we haven't looked at before, maybe particularly uh, high-speed astronomy, looking for transient phenomena, you know, that we might turn up something very unexpected. I think it's also really important to not anthropomorphize and look for civilizations with, that are very similar to ours, transmitting in the FM band, radio, and stuff like that. I, I, think, given, um, I, think, I think it's much more likely that any advanced life that's actually out there right now, if there is any, is artificial intelligence rather than biological intelligence. Because... We've seen it, it took only you know, 400 years or so f from uh, inventing the telescope to being already on the cusp of building AI, which is nothing, right, compared to the billions of years of biological evolution. And so <clears throat> if you um, have another civilization where life evolves and starts making advanced technology, the phase when they're still biological but able to transmit radio signals or whatever to us, it's going to be very short compared to the billions of years afterwards when they'll have some sort of AI civilization. So we're much more likely to, to see that if we see anything. How about, would you, would you buy, with this money, would you buy microscopes in order to look for nano-aliens? I think we should look for everything. We should be cast a very wide net. You know, if you have no clue what you're looking for, it's important to not just... How about, could we be inside of an post? alien? So you can imagine your neurons inside your brain, and the neuron says, "Hey, where? Who am I? And is there any way that it could? What it? What could it do to figure out that it's inside of your head? So maybe we're inside of a giant alien. What could we do to figure out whether we're inside of such a thing? For example, in the Truman Show, the guy was had to sail and hit <laughs> hit the ceiling or something, hit the the wall of the enclosure. Is there? Is that what we do when we do at astronomy? Are we looking for an enclosure that we might be in? This is a so-called zoo hypothesis that the, the ball put forward that we are in a zoo controlled by more superior life forms. I'm not, wouldn't put too much of my money on that personally, but... Um, 
How about if you, we, you know, in the movie Contact, again, the, the, when Jodie Foster got the signals, they had this blueprint for a machine, and the general says, don't build that, that'll just destroy us if we build it. And, and Jerry Ostreicher is such, so paranoid about this that he thinks we should not even listen for aliens. So are you that paranoid? Obviously, the aliens, if they construct I think a message... You, I certainly think if we get a mess transmission from space, from some aliens telling us to build a machine, we should not. Yeah. <laughs> we should not build it. How about no, build parts of it or something? Keep them separate or something. <laughs> we should not build it. So you wouldn't build the, the machine to, uh, to do what... and then go to wonderful places like Jodie Foster did? No. There's a beautiful, beautiful uh, story about this in Hans Moravec's awesome book, Mind Children which I, I think of as cosmic spam. If you're, if you're a civilization trying to spread as fast as possible, obviously the fastest you could possibly spread is at the speed of light, right? So what you can do is you can uh, transmit this spam message in all directions, hoping that some, <clears throat> some naive, freshly evolved civilization picks this up and builds your <laughs> stupid <laughs> machine. It's cosmic fishing which will then uh, take over their planet and send out new such messages from there and colonize space and just leaving an empty husk of a civilization burnt out you know, behind. It's, it's not a bad uh, scheme for, for spreading. It's the best and fastest scheme for any civilization to spread out in space again because you can basically do it at the speed of light. It just relies on the gullibility of of other civilizations. So if we fell for that, it would be almost as lame as if you get an email saying, hey, <laughs> congratulations, you have won $100 million from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Just enter your bank account number here. So, you, so, you, so memes are obviously evolving faster than we are on this planet. Isn't that already going on? But not with alien memes, but with our, with the own, with our own here? Aren't, aren't memes already occupying your head and taking over and evolving faster than your brain evolves and therefore they're kind of in control because when you're in a situation where something is evolving quickly, something's evolving slowly, the thing that evolves quickly kind of takes over and wins. And aren't memes evolving much faster than our brains? Yeah, cultural evolution is much faster than biological evolution on this planet. That's why what's driven the technology explosion has been cultural evolution. And um, that's also partly why I think we may be at risk of, for extinction because we still have these brains that are like optimized for throwing rocks and picking bananas and we're asked to make decisions about nuclear weapons and things which we don't quite <laughs> have the wherewithal, where, where, wherewithal to handle. It's a bit like if you go into a kindergarten and you give them a bunch of hand grenades to play with, you know, not the best idea. So if you don't think that self-destruction, the L term in the Drake equation, it being so small is the answer to us being alone. You just think that life is rare in the universe. Well, there... Or you just there, hope it's not and you don't know. I hope it's not. I mean, that would be the saddest possible explanation of the Fermi paradox. If you actually evolve a lot of civilizations with the same potential as ours, and they pretty much all managed to go extinct through stupid use of some technology they invent. Basically, as soon as their technology, technological power exceeds their wisdom by, by too much, poof, next. That would be pretty sad. I'm, I'm, ho I'm fairly optimistic and hopeful that even if that happens to most civilizations, it's not going to happen to 99.9999999999 of them, you know, which is what you would need to solve the Fermi paradox. Okay, and, and uh, one last question is, are you sure you're not a set of measure zero? I'm what, guessing I'm What's not. the evidence for that? You think your mere existence is all the evidence you need to disqualify you as a set of measure zero? You can only have a set of measure zero within an infinite set. And I'm actually not convinced that there even is anything truly infinite. I have, I'm in a radical minority that thinks that infinity is, is something that we physicists and mathematicians have invented because it's incredibly convenient. 
even though it doesn't actually exist in the real world. Okay, and uh, the mathematical universe, uh, one question about the mathematical universe, that your book that you wrote, um, uh, you, I, th uh, I guess the one way to summarize it is that, hey, there's a way that we can envision self-consistent mathematics and then these and different laws that are self-consistent and then in this highest level multiverse, it's just, it explores everything. Now, but I've heard criticism about it as being, well, wait a minute, do, you, do we even know what the set of self-consistent mathematics is? There's a fuzzy boundary between ones that are and aren't self-consistent, therefore mm -hmm. there might be a continuum, so therefore it's, a, it's an, un, uh, an undis un undefined set. So, mm -hmm. it, so is, is this set defined? In what sense is it well defined? This uh, greatest parameter space that you've yeah, thought of. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think there is a lot of confusion about how great the set of mathematical structures is, but I think the confusion is entirely in the heads of us humans, not in in nature. I you, think so there, there's no evidence in... whatsoever that nature it's, is not mathematical, or that nature itself is in some way undefined. But we, I think, humans are quite confused about still a lot of these issues. Um, for example, we can invent a lot of, and write down a lot of mathematical structures that are girdle, that, that aren't, where, where you can't prove whether things are true or false because of girdle's incompleteness theorem and stuff like that. Our universe doesn't care, you know, so what? It, it, it exists, it's consistent, and if we can't prove that it's consistent, <laughs> why should it care? So that reminds me of the delta x, delta p greater than h bar, and whether x, whether objects do in fact have a position, or is this delta x uh, uh, the necess the epistemological limit that we have is really the ontological limit. It, it doesn't have a position really and we're just pretending that it does. So that's what you just did I think with math mm -hmm. or mathematical consistency. In that case, yeah, the position... In that case the position, the particle didn't actually have a position because there was a wave or there was this wave function there, that's right. I think there's, I think there's a lot more to be, that we have to understand about the foundations of mathematics. Okay. Again, but I don't, I don't, I think that's simply currently a limitation of our own human understanding, not any kind of limitation about our universe. And I don't think it's any kind of evidence that our universe doesn't know what it's doing or isn't mathematical. So again, are we alone? You want a shorter answer than the other two times? Yeah. My guess is that we humans are alone in our universe in the sense that there's no other civilization in this part of space that's even gotten to the point of inventing telescopes. Any last words for the students? <laughs> Keep on thinking about this question, which might be important. <laughs> Keep on thinking about this question, because the more you think about it, the more significant you're going to feel. The more <laughs> clear it's going to be to you that what we do here on this planet, in our lifetime, may shape not just the future of life here for billions of years, but the future of life in our entire universe. So I don't know what our descendants are going to think of us billions and billions of years from now if they've turned our cosmos into this wonderful place teeming with life and, and joy. But they're certainly not going to think of us as insignificant because if, if they think at all, it's going to be because of what you guys did in your lifetime. Let's make a difference. <laughs>